Hi everybody, Ryan Jackson here. Hope you're having a great day. I got an email from an apprentice the other day who told me that they were doing a hospital and they had some questions and they reached out and asked if I, if I could help them out. So I, I spoke to the individual and they said that they were doing an isolation power system in the operating room of a hospital. And he was confused as to what he was doing. He had a, a real thirst for knowledge. So he asked his foreman uh, about this particular system that they were doing and he said you know the foreman was able to, to answer some of his questions but not all of them and he asked his apprenticeship instructor and he said that you know he's a really sharp instructor but this was something that was really unusual and he, he wasn't very familiar with it so he asked if I could help him out and I told him I would do a video kind of showing what the isolation power system is in the transformer in, in the operating room and why we use them all right so let's take a look Okay, so an isolation power system on the left here, this is the panel board that would come, uh, that would feed the operating room in a hospital. And you can see here, it's a, it's a pretty unusual looking panel board. It's got the, uh, what we call an isolation monitor, a line isolation monitor up here, and it's talking about total hazard current. And there's a bunch of two pole breakers in it and nothing else, it's all two pole breakers. And this is an unusual system because it is an ungrounded system. When we look at 517.160A2, it says all circuits from the secondary of the isolation transformer must be ungrounded. All right, and what that means is that we're going to have an ungrounded system. All right, now take a look at the top left here. Look at the transformer windings. All right, so here we've got a transformer winding and it's 120 volts across the coil. All right, so it's just single phase. And then we take that transformer and we put it inside of a metal box and we connect the metal box to the earth and then we run equipment grounding conductors from the metal parts to all of our other metal parts, right, of all of our electrical equipment. So what's key here is that unlike pretty much every other system that we install, this is an ungrounded system, meaning that there is no connection between the metal parts and the actual transformer winding, all right? So the transformer winding is not connected to the metal parts and it's not connected to the earth. And it's absolutely critical that you understand that part, all right? If you, if you think of it as a normal system, this is never gonna make sense. So this is an ungrounded system, so the actual winding is not connected to the metal parts. All right, this is a transformer that I built years ago. Some of you might have seen this before, but here's my transformer. This is the primary right here, and it's just connected 120 volts right into a cord that I plug in and I turn it on. And this is the secondary, all right? And it's just one end of the coil connected to one side of the lamp and the other coil connected to the other side of the lamp. And really, it's identical to the one in the graphic here. So you've got the coil, right? And we're taking one end of it, going through a receptacle, going to one end of the lamp. And then off the other end of the coil, going through the receptacle, we're going to the other end of the lamp, all right? So this transformer here that we're looking at in the video is the exact same. Now I'm gonna drop this little, trim, this little screwdriver in there because it makes it work a little bit better. <clears throat> that when I turn it on, the lamp turns on, all right? This is an ungrounded system. What I mean by that is this coil of wire, the actual wire itself, is not connected to earth, and it's not connected to metal parts. Now, I want you to think about this for a minute. If I were to take a metal box and put it over the transformer, over and around the transformer, and then I drove a ground rod to the metal box and connected it down to the earth. What would the voltage be between the wire and the metal box? The answer is zero because there's no there's no connection between the wire and the metal box. It would just it would be just like asking you know what's the voltage from my relocatable power tap to this screwdriver? There is no voltage right because there's not a completed circuit. And that's the beauty of an ungrounded system. And that's why we use them in a hospital operating room. So there's no connection between the winding 
and the metal parts. And that's what's critical. We've got to, we have to agree with a fundamental electrical theory concept. And that is that you have to have a circuit, right? You must have a path from the winding back to the winding in order to have current flow. If you cut that path, there is no voltage and there is no current, right? We have to have a completed circuit. We know that. That's one of the first things we learn in first year apprenticeship class. You have to have a complete circuit. Now, if we go back and look at this, I run my one hot conductor, my ungrounded conductor, to the brass terminal of this receptacle, and then I run my other ungrounded conductor to the silver terminal of this receptacle. I don't want to call it the hot and neutral because there is no neutral in this system. It's two ungrounded conductors, all right? So one hot conductor to the brass terminal, one to the silver terminal, and then of course I install my equipment grounding conductor that goes from the metal parts to the grounding terminal of the receptacle. And then I plug in my equipment, just like the light that we did, and I've got one conductor that goes to the pin of the lamp, the other conductor goes to the shell of the lamp. Now in 517.160, it actually says that the that you have, this is the only place the code really specifies the color of the ungrounded conductors. It says this one has to be brown and this one has to be orange. And they each have to have a stripe on the wire also that's not a white or gray stripe. Now, drawing the stripe on this wire just proved to be too tedious. I'm, I'm a lot better at taking photographs than I am at drawing pictures with PowerPoint. So bear with me. I know there's supposed to be a stripe on there. Just, you know, take it easy. That was just far too much work for this. <laughs> all right, so let's take a look and let's measure voltage, all right? Down on the bottom left, we've got this receptacle. Brown wire goes to one side, orange wire goes to the other side. What would be the voltage then between the brown and the orange? The answer to that is 120. So it's an interesting system. You plug in your meter to what you would think is the hot and neutral. But again, there is no neutral. But you plug your meter in and you get 120. And you're thinking, hey, all right, I've got a regular old receptacle, 120 volts, just like I would normally get. Now here's where it gets strange. Let's move over here to the left. When I measure from the equipment grounding terminal to the silver screw, right, the left side of the receptacle, or if I move over to the right, if I measure voltage from the equipment grounding terminal to the brass screw, either way, I get zero volts. There is no voltage between those. Now, why is there no voltage? Because there's no circuit, all right? Measuring voltage from the ungrounded conductors of an ungrounded system is just like trying to measure voltage from a power source to a screwdriver sitting on your desk. There is no voltage, all right? And that's why we use this system. So as we know, our resistance to electric shock is our skin, all right? So our skin is what prevents us from dying during an electric shock, at least hopefully. So of course, the higher the voltage, the worse the shock's gonna be, and the, the lower the resistance of my skin, the worse the shock's gonna be. But here's the thing, if I'm in a hospital operating room, and I've got this patient's chest cavity opened up and I'm in there doing open heart surgery, if that patient gets shocked by electromedical equipment, they're dead. For, forget shock, they're gone, right? You, you can't just di uh, directly apply electricity to the, to the circulatory system and expect the person to survive, they won't. So if you shock somebody during open heart surgery, they're done, they're dead. All right, so what can I do to prevent that? I use an ungrounded system because then you don't get current flow during a fault. So we've got our hot conductors going through the receptacle. We plug in our equipment, whether it's a light or some sort of electromedical device. We've got our two hot conductors, our two ungrounded conductors. One goes to the pin on the lamp, the other one goes to the shell and the lamp turns on and everything's good, but then I have a ground fault, all right? So one of those two ungrounded conductors energizes the metal parts of the electrical equipment, whether it's a light or a, a, you know, a saw, the, you know, the drill, whatever the, whatever the people are using in the, in the procedure, and it energizes it. And let's say the patient is touching that equipment and also touching another piece of metal, or it could be the doctor that gets shocked. Right? If the doctor's in there touching me, 
we don't need the doctor to get shocked right now either because then he'll get a shock and he'll kill me. So either way, but watch what happens. The ungrounded conductor energizes the metal parts and let's follow the fault current. Goes down the equipment grounding conductor, through the cord, back into the grounding terminal of the receptacle, back over here to the metal box that the transformer is sitting in. But it doesn't get back to the source because there is no connection to the source. It's like I've taken my scissors, my dikes, and cut the wire. Right? I've severed the connection. I've opened the circuit. And if we don't have a circuit, then we don't have a voltage or a current. All right? So we open the circuit, and that means that the patient doesn't get injured. Now, when that happens, what will happen is you will get a tiny, tiny amount of current. And what that current is known as is called the charging current, the capacitive charge, all right? So you will build up some capacitance on this system. And, and there's safeguards in place in the NEC. It says there's, there's informational notes that say, look, you want to use a small system like a 10 kV8 uh, transformer. You want to use XHHW conductors, uh, cross-link polyethylene, so that we have a, a good dielectric strength. We don't want to use any wire pulling lubricants on the wire when we're, when we're pulling it in through the conduit, or if we do, uh, they have to be non-conductive. And, and special dielectric strength. So we will get a little bit of charging current on this system though. And when that happens, that can become dangerous. You know, if, if you build up some capacitive charge in your house because you took off your shoes and you rubbed your socks on the carpet and you're rubbing balloons on your head and everything else and you start getting electrostatic discharge, that can be a pretty high voltage event. And that's certainly not gonna kill you in your house. But if you've got a guy's chest cracked open, could be a different story. So when we build up a capacitive charge, the line isolation monitor, which is this guy, goes into alarm. All right, so if you can see it, it says safe right here, and it's currently safe when the picture was taken. And then over here on the red, there's a light that will turn on if it goes into hazard. And this one, I think, had a has an audible alarm as well. And then the... Uh, whoever is in charge of the line isolation monitor, usually it's the head nurse, they are monitoring the hazard current, and if that goes into, into alarm, then they'll tell the surgeon and will stop the procedure and do whatever is necessary to clear the ground fault or to dis, you know, do some sort of electrostatic discharge to get rid of the charging current or the hazard current. So that's what we have when we have a, an isolation system in the operating room of a hospital. So there you go. It's a, it's a very unusual system. And uh, if you ever get to wire one, uh, take the time to really look at it and, and, and enjoy it and, and try and wrap your head around it as best you can because it's a system that not everybody gets to see. And it's, uh, it's a pretty neat system. Oh, by the way, uh, I mentioned two pole breakers, right? So each one of these ungrounded conductors goes through a circuit breaker, like a 20 amp breaker. Um, and they're all two pole breakers. So yeah, if I had a fault, let's, let's look at this. What if I had a fault from the orange wire over here to the metal parts? Well, that would become a short circuit, wouldn't it? That would be like just going, opening up the transformer and taking a wire or a piece of pipe and just shoving it inside the transformer. You're going to get lots of current flowing and the breaker is going to trip immediately. So you have, to have, you have to have two pole breakers. If you have a line-to-line -line fault, it becomes a short circuit and it will trip. If you have a, a ground fault on the two different polarities, on one ungrounded conductor and then a different ungrounded conductor has a ground fault, that becomes a short circuit as well. And that trips the overcurrent protection device. So it's, a, it's an interesting system. And I hope you guys got something out of the video, hopefully to the person that, that reached out to me. Hopefully this makes sense to you. And hopefully it makes sense to anybody that watches the video. So there you go, ungrounded systems and the line isolation monitor in a hospital operatory. Thanks everybody, have a great day. Be sure to like, follow, subscribe, and ring the bell.